going to vary it. And I, you know, when I first put this handout together, all I basically did was assess the MIBI by itself and the technetium and the thallus chloride. Nobody that I know of anymore does the thallium and the technetium anymore. If you do anything, it will be cystamibium and technetium. Okay. That's, that seems to be the most common dual isotope method we have. <coughs> okay. Um, and then this is the single isotope method. Again, what you all should be doing is developing a brain book that has all of these protocols spelled out. As I said, you know, in a crunch, you can use the nuclear medicine technology procedures book. But there's a disclaimer in there. Did anybody read the disclaimer? Okay. The Sackett book is a compilation of multiple uh, procedures. So, you know, your doctor may not like the way that, you know, it's written up here, but at least you'll have something. You'll have a template that you can use for this. Okay. Um, you know, so even things like what collimator to use. To use a uh, low energy, high resolution collimator with computer magnification, or do you, you know, use a pinhole? It sort of depends on what you got available, right? Okay, so the other thing is, uh, this is, I brought this here. Again, I like Cedar Sinai because anything and everything that you can do for nuclear medicine, they do. They go really overboard. Okay, um, so notice with them, okay, they, uh, they do a 10 minute anterior, then they do a spec. Do any of you guys do spec? No. No, okay. Um, so 45 minutes acquisition. Um, just out of curiosity, have any of you set up the spec? I mean, I'm not. not for this, but I have done spec, yes. Okay. Um, when you did the scan, what did you notice about the, the differences in your acquisition? Okay, so in other words, if you're doing just a planar image, um, what kind of a matrix did you use? For the computer game hand, no idea. Okay. If you're asking. Okay. <laughs> so future future reference, guys. If you know when you're when you're doing these things, um, in your Shacket book, put down the computer matrix. I don't remember if he has it in there or not. But if he doesn't, put it in there because you may you know if you ever lose your. Like, Computer, Are you gonna, asking though, like the 256 by 256 or whatever it is, like yeah. that matrix? Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think didn't, I think I showed you what the matrix looks like, didn't I? That time yeah. by going to the long time you know, ago. Computer. Yeah. 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 Um, but one of the things uh, I never thought about this before until we started doing statistics. But if you notice that when we do spec. Okay, how many projections do we do around the patient? We go 360 degrees. But how many stops do we make? 69. Okay, well, for hearts, it's six degrees. Okay, there's six degrees between projections, so how many is that? 60. Well, normally we do 64 projections. Okay. Uh, does anybody know why you do 64 projections and why 6 degrees between the projections is so important? Can I guess would be overlap? I was about to say that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, really. Well, typically with the spec, we use 64 by 64 because that gives us a larger matrix and because we only look at the area for a short period of time, it is for statistical reasons. So it reduces the amount of error. But if you go more than 6 degrees between projections, um, now this, this artifact was actually caused by an injection site, but what happens is you get these areas between these ray paths if you go more than six degrees. 
So all of our imaging is deliberately done so that you don't go more than six degrees. Okay, when you guys do a heart study, you know, you have a minimum of 180 degrees, but how many projections do you do? No, not, not for hearts, usually. 32 to each other. I don't understand why over six degrees it makes it look like that. Well, it's because of the back projection. Um, when it does the back projection, there's actually a big <coughs> gap between the two um, projections. So there's a blank space, and so it doesn't know what to back project, so you get that, you get these white lines here. So you can magnify that a little bit. So you got like the blind spot in the eye? Yeah. Yeah. But what you would be getting, see how, now don't look at this here, but this is another problem that if you guys have an injection site, yeah, these white lines here are what would occur if you have more than six degrees between your projections. But remember, you're the one that controls how many degrees you have or how many projections that you do. That's less. Huh? It's less degrees. Well, if, you go, if, it, if it's less degrees, then that fills it in. You get a better picture. But the problem is we have to trade time for, yeah, we have to balance, you know, how much time are we willing to spend. Um, but I just wanted you to see that because a lot of times people don't understand um, what the parameters of SPECT are. And since, you know, typically you're only looking at the area for about 25 or 30 seconds, you know, maybe 40 seconds for some low intensity stuff, but, you know, either way it's, it's not very a long period of time. Um, I don't really know if there's much more exciting stuff that we can talk about with this, um, other than I mean, you know, spec image is actually one of the, I mean, par parathyroid imaging is one of the fun ones to do, isn't it? What's that called again, those white lines? Um, well, the, it's caused because there's this back projection filter that we use for it, but they're called rate halves. Um, I'm trying to think if there was something interesting. This is, this is an example of another subtraction image down here. Okay, so uh, here's the thallium, here's the technesium, and then here's the subtracted. I, I think I don't want to beat this to death. Do you? Okay. I'm trying to think of what else we have here. This is a this is a, a nice little spec image here that I actually think that uh, as you as you were doing the um, the anterior the the anterior chest uh, the anterior neck the anterior neck with the marker uh, and obliques is probably the most that you need. I don't really see where you get that much more information out of the spec. Uh, now, what type of a reconstruction is this? Coronal, sagittal, axial, which one? Coronal? Okay, coronal, very good. Yeah, remember because we're slicing from anterior to posterior. So, um, as you see, as you're going through the, here you see the thyroid gland, and as we slice through the thyroid, we see the abnormal by itself. So, um, again, it just shows that it's not in the gland. Very rarely is it embedded in the thyroid, but whenever they're doing surgery to remove the thyroid, either because of cancer or hyperthyroidism, um, they can damage the parathyroids. Like I said, you, you probably never even know it was there. Um, I think that's about it. Let me just take one last little, one little section here on shackets for a moment and see if there's anything that we need to... Okay, and take a look at Shackett's book for a second. 
about him is he puts it in alphabetical order, but sometimes he calls it different things. Do you guys like the Shackett book? I wish you guys would have told me that you went out and bought it, because it would have gotten a really good price for it. You got the free? You got the free? Huh? That's included with our program. Oh, really? Yes. The only thing that you had to buy was the requisites. Yeah, yeah the, the nuclear medicine. Uh, that was a SNM thing. Um, you it, guys it, got jackets? I thought I bought one. I bought one. No. No, they gave it to us. No, they gave it to us. Because we got the ANCs and the NASA. That's a jacket. That's a jacket. That's the one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we bought that. You guys right. got this yeah. one? You guys bought yeah, this one? Yeah, we bought that, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. we got the, the MacBook and the other one for free. Yeah. yeah. That's a good deal. Yes, the email. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we bought it. Yeah, the first one. Yeah, yeah, right. When did we go? <laughs> yeah, we yeah, we bought it before the school year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I got it for yeah. Money back. Yeah, I spent like 40 bucks. <laughs> I, I, I spent 80 bucks. I got requisites for free, too. Did you for really? free? Yeah, we all got it for free. Oh, listen, <laughs> listen to Greg, man. Oh, Greg's hey. trying to start a war here. Okay. Um, anyway, so, so moving along here a little bit here, and what you, you're going to need to pay attention to. Uh, I'm going to give you a little quiz next week over thyroid and parathyroid. Under oh. shackets? <coughs> yeah. What? Well, I think shackets would probably be a little bit more involved than the other ones. But this guy here, he lists everything. Okay, so you've got the radionuclides here. So you've got technetium, you've got thallium. Um, and you've got I-123. You know, normally, as I said, the, the money radionuclide is the sestamibi. Okay, the uh, sestamibi and the thallus chloride are the two radiopharmaceuticals that go to the parathyroid. The protectantate and the I-123 are, are all just designed to show you where the thyroid is. So you can subtract it or, you know, get a better idea of where the adenome is. Do you want us to do all five of them? Well... Uh, the protectinate, yeah, the thallus chloride, yeah, the system maybe, yeah. I-123, well, like I said, it's, you need to understand what it's being used for. There are some, I know that some of my affiliates were doing the I-123 scan. So in other words, they would give it to the patient, they'd bring them back for the four-hour imaging, and then they would do an uptake, then they would inject it with uh, system maybe. Would that be like a deal kind of way? Yeah. So instead of pallias, instead of, <clears throat> instead of pallium, they're using 123 iodine. Yeah, there, there's actually three combinations of dual isotopes you can use now. Um, back in the old days, it was just thallium and technetium. Okay, but now you've got cestamibi and technetium. You've got I-123 and cestamibi. So you've got, you know, just remember that you normally have to have one radionuclide that goes specifically to the thyroid. And one that accumulates in the parathyroid. So, so the which ones accumulate only in the thyroid? Okay, the ones, uh, the, well, the ones that accumulate in the thyroid are the I-123 and the technetium. Okay. The ones that accumulate in the parathyroid are the thallium and the cestamibi. Yeah. Well, tetra I call it. I can consider tetra. Cestamibi and tetraphosphate are like very interchangeable. They're, they're pretty similar. Um, there are differences between them. Um, the, most people don't like the tetraphosmine because it takes longer. But I mean, you know, they're very, very similar in the way that they accumulate in the heart. Uh, they're actually saying that, that sesamibi is better because it gets cleared out faster. Tetraphosmine, on the other hand, kind of lasts longer. But anyway, so these methods of localization, I would expect you to be aware of also. So, uh, trapping mechanism of the thyroid, you might want to put a little note there. Um, so active transport, it's not really active transport for the technetium, it's just trapping. 
Okay, and then with thallus chloride, potassium, uh, sodium potassium pump. And because of the um, parathyroid adenomas, it says, notice it says the blood flow, uh, it stays in there longer. So, it just, I don't know what kind of a method of localization that would be. But, and then the system maybe it says passive transport in proportion to blood flow to the thyroid. And then because there's abnormal blood flow to the parathyroid, it stays in there longer. What is a passive transport maybe? Well, passive transport is just because there's more of the solution outside of the cell membrane, so it just slowly crosses over, and so it equals itself out. So what will happen is the system maybe will go in there, and it will stay in there, but then eventually after, you know, it will start going back out into the bloodstream. But it, very, it accumulates in there faster, and goes out more slowly because of the blood supply to the abdomen. Okay. okay, and then uh, this, again, like I said, the uh, IMA 23, again, just to image the thyroid. So um, and that, that's all we're basically doing. We have the two that go to the uh, parathyroids and two that go to the thyroid. <coughs> um, we're not going to worry too much about the, you know, like I say, you, the reason I wanted to cover a little bit of radio pharmacies because they talk about this stuff. And especially like chromatography, we, we know how to find moly now, right? We just look at the spectrometer and we see a different peak or we take the technetium and we put it in a shielded vial and absorb the 140 keV. We know that we you know have to have 0.15 microcurie of molybdenum for every millicurie technetium. Okay. Uh, the thallus chloride, uh, again with chromatography, the thallium does break down. Normally it has a plus three valence when it separates off of the chloride. Okay, but normally, remember, it's a potassium analog. So mostly it was used for heart imaging. Okay, but you know, this is just another use for it. Um, and then, does everyone know how to calculate the percent tagging? You guys remember how to do that? When I say 90% tagging, how in the world do we do that? Maybe a quick overview of how we do that. Because I know you've been staying up late at night wondering how that happens, right? <laughs> um, and this is actually, you're going to find this in two places. Uh, in the Anstey's book of Radio Pharmacy. And also in your math book, there's a big section on chromatography calculations. Definitely you will see those on your exams. And remember, what are the two contaminants of technetium that we're looking for when we do chromatography? Lithium. Okay, we have radionuclidic impurities. Okay, and that's our 99 molybdenum. Okay, and 0.15 microcuries per one millicurie of technetium. Okay, um, when we have protectinate, we have what we call radiochemical impurities. And the first one that we have is free technetium. Okay. Uh, remember that the technetium, when we elude it from the generator, it has a plus seven valence. So we reduce it with tin chloride to make it a plus three or four, so it binds with our other stuff. The other one is hydrolyzed reduced technetium. Okay. And 
the other thing that this is also called technetium dioxide. Uh, what normally happens is the water that we use to elute the generator, the, the normal saline, it becomes ionized and the free electrons are picked up by this and uh, cause the technetium to change its valence and form this technetium dioxide. Okay, so when it comes to doing radiochemical um, purity testing, uh, Remember, what we're going to be doing is um, we have a piece of filter paper and we put it in a solvent. Now the type of solvent is what we use to determine whether we're looking for free technetium or hydrolyzed reduced technetium. So in this solvent here is, I'm just going to put normal saline. Okay, so that's just normal sodium chloride in water, a okay, 0.9% solution. Okay, now, actually before I do that, I normally put a drop of the eluent here. This is called the origin. Okay, when I put this piece of paper with the... Uh, drop of my 99M technetium, uh, the sodium chloride is going to start moving up this paper through what we call capillary action. You guys have done this in this, probably when you go to Denny's or something and you take a straw, mm -hmm. put a little drop of water on it, and you, yeah. Uh, but the movement of the water through the paper is called capillary action. So what will happen is it will keep, it will rise up. Normally you keep it for a set amount of time, and then what will happen is you create what they call a solvent front. Okay. Now the technetium that's in the good state will stay here. So this is the good. This is what we call the bound technetium. So if you've made up a radiopharmaceutical kit, like this might be 99M technetium uh, MDP or anything else. So your radiopharmaceutical that you've made up is here. And the free technetium will rise with the solvent front. And it's going to travel a certain distance here. And this will be your free technetium. So there's a couple of, there's, there's two bits of information that we get from this. Um, one is what we call, well, the, basically the percent tagging, but the other is what we call relative flow. Okay. Um, basically, every time you do this test, we measure the distance from the um, origin to the technetium and the origin to the solvent front. Okay, uh, so let's say that this is five centimeters here, and this is ten centimeters here. So the RF would then be uh, five divided by ten or point five. So every time that I made up an MDP kit and I did this, I would get the same relative flow. Um, get your hand, Steve, sir. Handy. They didn't emphasize this as much as they do now, but in chapter three on the radio pharmacy, On page 29, okay, they talk about distance the component travels uh, from the origin, uh, distance solvent front from the origin. Okay. Now, one of the pages in here, it tells you what the relative flow should be for all of your kits. So on page 30, 
this is the, the amount of travel we would expect. And so when it does that, that's good, because that means that everything in your kit is, is working the way that it should. Does that make sense? So this is on page 30. Okay. Um, but then the other thing that we want to know is, okay, what is the percent tagging? What some people do is that after they've calculated the relative flow, they'll then cut this piece of paper in half. Okay, so here's my origin down here, and then here's my free technesium up here. And we'll call this free and we'll call this one bound. But basically, you know, if we have uh, 100,000 counts here, and we have 5,000 counts here, then the way that we calculate the percent tagging, okay, if I do it with the 5,000 counts up here, I then would divide that by 100,000 plus the 5,000. This would tell me the, the free. If I put the 100,000 up on top, then I would have 100,000 uh, divided by 105,000. Okay. So whenever they're talking about that, this is what we're, we're trying to calculate for the percent tagging. Okay. Now, the hydrolyzed reduced technesium is, a, is kind of done the same way, except uh, we change the solvent that we use. Everyone okay on this one here? That's like page 29 and 30 of the uh, NC. Okay, so for this for calculating the hydrolyzed reduced technesium, I forgot to put the end there. Uh, now we use a different solvent like acetone. Do they have MLK or M MK something or MEK? Methyl ethyl ketone? You, you guys don't manufacture methamphetamine in your bathrooms, so I take <laughs> Yeah, well, anyway, so, so depending upon what kit you're using or what you're doing, you'll use one of these two solvents. And, you know, these are things that you use, like, for removing fingernail polish. So they're very, like, aromatic uh, carbon-type stuff. Okay, so this time we're going to put the 99M technesium here. <coughs> or, let's see, the technesium MDP. Only this time, when the solvent travels up here, okay, your 99M technesium MDP is going to be up here, and your hydrolyzed reduced technesium is going to remain at the origin. But it's, it's basically the same principle. <clears throat> so what we do is we we then will calculate, uh, you know, the percent tagging based on how what the percentage of this is. You know, in the last calculation, I got what five percent. Okay, so in the other one that we had, uh, here we have the MDP that stayed down here and the free tech went up here and we normally use saline for that normal saline okay and we got a you know we did the calculation we had 5,000 over 100,000 plus 5,000 uh, so if you think of it of A over B like this you have A over A plus B. That's for the free. And if you have B over A plus B, that's the bound. 
We do the same thing over here. Except in this case, this is the bound, and this is the, not the free, but this is the hydrolyzed reduced. So let's say that we get, you know, 100,000 or 100,000 counts up here, and 1,000 counts here. You don't normally get as much hydrolyzed reduced technetium. And if you accidentally inject this into a patient, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't go to any organs. It just kind of stays in the soft tissue and reduces the contrast or the, you know, it just makes your skin look like there's a lot of soft tissue uptake. Does that make sense? Because <clears throat> it doesn't go where it's supposed to go. It just stays in circulation. Okay, so we'll do the same thing over here. So we get 1,000... Well, there's no difference, or what's the difference between free tech and hydrolyzer? Well, this stuff here, this is this is an ion, so it's it's just free technetium that's um, kind of floating around, um, and the, the hydrolyzed reduced technetium, this is technetium that has been, um, it's like it's been given a reducing agent. Um, or I'm sorry, it's, it's been oxidized, and so what will happen is it doesn't combine with anything. You can't make it mix with anything. A lot of times this stuff stays attached to the column um, in your generator. So that's why when they talk about the efficiency of a generator, they say, you know, you don't get 100% of the uh, technetium off of the molybdenum core because of this. The stuff that stays, you have about 20% of it stays attached to the core. So, when you milk a generator, you might get anywhere between 80 and 90 percent of what's actually there. Okay, but so here we have uh, again we have our uh, one or about one percent, one thousand by divided by hundred and one thousand. Yeah. Okay, so over here we had like five percent, and over here we have one percent. So you add that together, so the actual uh, tagging is going to be 94%. Uh, because it's going to be 100% minus the 5% for the 3, and minus 1% for the hydrolyzed reduced, so 94%. Does that make sense? give you back your books to see on page 29 and 30. Um, there's actually, there was a good question in your boards. I know you guys haven't had much time to go through this, right? Is that the only one? Huh? Is, that, is that the book for boards? Um, it's one that I think is really good. I. I mean, I've got more than I'm going to give you guys, but... Is that for ADRT and SMTTV? Both? Yeah. Is that book, is the older version of the one that... Um... Yeah, the Ann Steves, they've got some of the questions from still from here, but this one has a lot of questions, and uh, they're good questions. So uh, that's why I, I think I gave it to you guys already. <coughs> Did I already send you, you some pieces? Well, you sent some, you know, one there. chapter here, one chapter there, but we don't know if you sent the whole book here. Would be Top nice. Secrets. We cannot give you other the secrets. <laughs> Would be you nice. Will, you somebody. will become dangerous. But now here's a, here's a good question that, that's in here. Um, say, after a chromatography strip containing a sample of the radiopharmacical was developed, uh, with the solvent cut in half and count of the following results were obtained. Okay, so on system one here, um, okay, this one was the one that was done for the free technetium. The reason I know that is because the origin has a higher number of counts. So the bound, this would be my MDP, and then this would be the free technetium. Okay, on the other system, which is for the hydrolyzed reduced technetium, your MDP moves with the solvent, but the hydrolyzed reduced technetium stays at the origin. 
So that's why this number is higher up here. So what you would do then is you would calculate the percentages the way that we showed you, and then uh, you would find out what the percentage is, you know, subtract it from 100%, and then uh, you would be able to tell what your tagging truthfully is. Okay? So the 1716, you have to move both, right? Yeah, this, you do them separately here. So basically, I mean, it depends if you're looking for the percent that's free. If I'm looking for the percent that's free, I put 1716 um, above the vinculum, mm -hmm. and then it's going to be that divided by 23706 plus 1716. It doesn't say, though. What do you mean? The question is, does say free or bound? Let's say, what is the tagging of Christiancy? Does that mean it's sold? Bound. Yeah, the, the two factors that are going to prevent your radioactive material from attaching to the MVP are the free technesium and the hydrolyzed reduced technesium. So what happens then is when you inject it into the patient, uh, this stuff up here, this is the one that goes to the stomach, the salivary glands, thyroid, choroid plexus. Um, this one here just stays in circulation, it just stays in the blood. Okay, it doesn't go anywhere. Okay? But if you were to calculate this out, okay, like I said, you would have for the part on top, uh, 1,716 divided by 23706. Oh, okay, plus 1716. Okay, so that's for the free technesium. Now, did you see how I figured that out? Okay, like I said, the free technesium moves, the bound doesn't. Okay, on system number two for hydrolyzed reduced, your MDP moves, your hydrolyzed reduced technesium stays at the origin. Okay, so then for the second part down here, you would have, is that 1,200? Yeah. Over 21001. Plus one two zero. This is bound. Yeah. This. Oh, this. No. This is the hydrolyzed reduced. See, both of both of these. When I set up the equation like this, I'm setting it up to show the the unbound portion. So that's twelve percent added together. Twelve point one. Okay. So that gives you the three. Uh, so what'd you get? The six. Yeah, so you would subtract 12 from 100, and it's around 88%. Okay, so there's your answer there, 87.9. Actually, probably you got 12.1. Yeah, and then you subtract that from 100. Yeah, subtract that from 100. Uh, be careful, people, when you guys are doing your board exams, they will give you answers if you set up the problem incorrectly, like this. Oh man, 12%. Okay, yes. Answer C. No. You needed to subtract that from 100 to get the 87%. Huh? You're good. Oh yeah. I taught him, I taught him as best I could, man. Yeah, but tricky. <laughs> okay, well, have you guys had enough for today? Yes. Fresno, have you had enough? Definitely. Um, I know Terry had some questions for you about the first quiz. You want me to go and get it for you? Yeah, would you please? Can I see that? Yeah, call me right back. This book. Which one? The one right now. Mr. Hackney. There's a new quiz on the thyroid. And that's yeah. it? Yeah. And I'm going to send you a copy of one of my old gas detector quizzes. Just for reference? Yeah, so that we can, so that we can go over it, you know? And then we'll start the gamma camera. Do you have so like on the whole procedure, right? Like or is it just yeah. the radio pharmacy?